So, Eric, welcome to the Black and Raw podcast. It's really good to have you on. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks. No, bro, thank you for joining me. Um, and so, you know, when we talked to before about um, coming onto the podcast and I, I really liked your profile when I heard about um, everything you were doing. Um, and if it so happens, my mom is also a lawyer. She's an immigration law. Um, okay. My brother is also studying law as well. Um, so there's a lot of law in the family. Um, I maybe was going to do it, but then I was like, I don't, there was a lot of extra work that I had to do. And I was like, I don't think I love law that much. <laughs> it sounds good, don't get me wrong, but I don't think I love it that much. Right. To the extra work. Um, but for you, you grew up um, with a father who was a cop. Um, so I wonder what what was that like? Like, so growing up with a dad that was a cop, especially, um, I don't know, I guess in America just generally. I mean, even in the UK, we have there's strange relationships with police. So I imagine for you, I don't know, did that bring up anything or was anything sort of said to you as a kid? um yeah yeah so so it's kind of odd right so um my father's black you know african-american so um there weren't a lot of black police officers and he joined the force and must have been 68 or 6 1968 or 1969 shortly after the riots here in detroit which were sort of the worst riots in our country's history uh, and there weren't a lot of black police officers. He used to tell me about, you know, I mean, years later, he told me about instances yeah. where he had fellow police officers, white police officers who didn't realize that he was a cop. You know, he'd be pulled over and have a gun in his face. And um, so early on, I learned you kind of have to learn how to deal with police officers. So one of the best things about that was I early on learned how to deal with the police without, you know, ending up shot dead, mm. uh, which, you know, really shouldn't be something you have to worry about. <laughs> no, nah, it shouldn't, should it? But no. world we live in. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing was, um, so my father, he worked undercover, worked narcotics. And, oh, that's um, kind of cool. I can't lie. I, I immediately go to like all the TV shows and there's like undercover cop sort of <laughs> Yeah, well, when I was in about third grade, he showed up one day to pick me up from school and he was still dressed, you know, basically undercover and they didn't want to let him me go with him. <laughs> <laughs> there was like this whole period of him explaining who he was, which was kind of weird. And as I got older and kind of began to understand exactly what his job was, I used to, I'll be honest, I used to worry about him coming home at night. Mm. Now, I mean, he you know, never was shot or anything on the job as, as a police officer. But as a kid, it's kind of scary when you start hearing all these things about, you know, what police officers are dealing with. And then at the same time, as you get begin to understand how certain communities, particularly black and poor communities, interact with the police. And you're like, is that my dad? You know, it's yeah. it, it, all, it was very, very strange. Um, and then... He actually ended up, um, he lost his right arm due to a cancer from Agent Orange exposure oh. when he was in Vietnam. So um, my father was a soldier, 101st Airborne Division. And uh, so there's this bizarre form of cancer that was linked to Agent Orange, which is defoliant. They would spray it on the jungle so that, you know, nobody could hide in the jungle and make it easier for the soldiers. But they would spray it on the soldiers and learn later turned out it caused cancer. So my father had to, um, he retired from the police department. Uh, and then I was just starting college when this happened. And he um, he became a police officer. He became an attorney and spent, you know, the rest of his legal career suing police officers. <laughs> That's a little workaround. <laughs> yeah, it, it was funny. He used to say cops lie frequently. They just don't lie well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was it was an interesting uh it was an interesting time growing up like that. That is very interesting. Yeah. And he went through sort of quite a few few stages, like being being and being a cop and then going to Vietnam and then yeah, funny funny enough, then you know, being an attorney and then suing um and then you know, suing and going after police. I imagine was he 
he probably wasn't allowed to go after people he worked with or in the district that he was in. I don't know. Was there anything about that? Because I can imagine they probably would have looked at him being like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing here? Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so this is the funny part. He retired as a lieutenant, which is, you know, fairly high up. And uh, he did, he did. So basically the way it would work is if someone was arrested or, or you know, uh, or abused by the police, he would do the criminal part to get them off because you couldn't really sue for the abuse part unless, in most instances, unless you sort of uh, at least wouldn't find a sympathetic jury unless you were cleared of the criminal part. Mm-hmm. And then he also did the the civil suits, so the lawsuits based on the police violate people's rights. And um, so the fact that he was a police lieutenant made him really good at it because he would get people on the stand and they would say, Oh, we did it like this. And he'd say, well, you know, uh, in my days as a police officer, our training was this. And I used to drive uh, opposing counsel crazy because it's hard to argue with somebody. It's almost yeah. like he had an expert witness, <laughs> but it was just him, you know, saying his own experiences. So uh, yeah, it was, uh, he did occasionally bump into people he worked with, but you know, is what it is. Yeah, having that in your yeah. back pocket, though, isn't it? Like on on court, just being like, "Well, listen, I was an officer, so I know you're lying straight for your teeth, mate." Like, I can basically, just see it, yes, <laughs> right. That was basically how it worked out. So, um, and oddly enough, my son is a cop now. Oh, so you guys are a family of cops and lawyers, which is kind of cool. I like that. Very interesting. So, for you, was seeing your dad being a lawyer sort of made you want to go into a law um or was it like no not at all <laughs> no not at all no i never right so yeah i never wanted to be a, a lawyer i actually um so i i i've been a sort of i I've, I've been an activist since you know i was since i first went to university so for me I was always protesting and always involved in that. And when I came out of school, when I came out, when I finished actually grad school, I went and worked for a nonprofit that helped feed people and ran, you know, children's programs and the like. And I did that for eight years before I actually went off to law school. Um, And so for me, it was always a matter of community. So when I went to law school, I actually, uh, when I finally decided to go to law school, and I, I didn't do that until I was 30, um, and I wanted to be a public defender, right? I wanted to be one of the people who defended people who couldn't afford to have a lawyer when they went to court. Yeah. Um, and so for, for listeners who don't know in the United States, in order to grad, in order to practice law, even to take the exam to practice, to become a, an attorney, you have to, uh, it's a graduate degree now in, 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 England, it's a it's very different. It, uh, law is pretty mm-hmm. much a, a, it's an undergraduate degree. And then, you know, you go off to whatever temple or whatever, depending on, you know, what they're going to be up. We also don't have the, the know, differences. Sort of yeah. You guys. Barrister and, yeah. Right? <laughs> so we, we don't do that. We have just sort of one lawyer <laughs> and any, he can do it all. Um, so it's, it's it requires going to, you know, separately going to law school. And when I graduated, I wanted to be a public defender. Uh, but America being what it is, they were underfunded Kings County in New York, where I, gra- you know, I graduated from law school in New York. So, uh, the office that was hiring people actually had a hiring freeze because it didn't have a, any money to hire additional lawyers. So, uh, I ended up going to work for a large firm in New York, uh, I did not enjoy it. It was, was all about say, I money. Can, I can see it on your face. You like even before you said anything, <laughs> I could just see the squirm. Like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want to think. <laughs> it was it was literally basically the worst experience of my life that didn't involve somebody dying. It wow. was completely unpleasant. So how so uh, how come do you mind me asking how come it was it was such an experience like that? So I went to work, I went to work for a large firm in New York, it was actually called Winston and Strong. And uh, I was in our litigation practice group. And the, the salary was nice. I'm not going to lie. Salary I can imagine were, so. Were, <laughs> the salary was fine. Um, but uh, so lawyers, 
other than most lawyers in America bill by the hour, right? So you're required to keep track of every minute of every day. And of course, the more hours you bill, the more money you make. And so uh, I, they were billing me out at like $400 an hour. And to be honest, I probably wasn't worth that because I just graduated from law school and knew nothing. But so they would bill me out and I didn't get that much money for, you know, I was making more money for the firm, obviously, than I was making yeah. for myself. And so there were times when I'd work, you know, 60, 70, 80, 100 hours a week. Wow. And I remember one time in particular, uh, our office had showers in it, but the hot water wasn't working. So nobody wanted to take a cold shower. And I'd, <laughs> I'd been at work. It was you know later in the week. So I'd probably already worked 80 hours that week. And the guy I worked with could do named Corey, Corey Stern, a uh, good dude. <laughs> He wanted to go home to take a shower because we'd been at work so for so long. And the partner we were working for, he asked her, could he go home? He's like, I live upper, you know, like upper east side. I can be there, shower me back in an hour. And she said, Well, can you do it in half an hour? He goes, No, I can't do it in half an hour. <laughs> can you I, I can't do it in an hour. <laughs> and she said, No. And this is not an apocryphal story. I was standing next to him. Now, Corey was a big dude because he played like American football in college, you know, university. So he was a, he was a fairly big guy. Yeah. And and the partner was a little bitty lady. And he and he said, you're not going to let me go home and shower. <laughs> and she poked him in the chest and said, I own you. And <laughs> wow. then she walked away. <laughs> <laughs> And Corey looked at me. And Corey looked at me. Like I said, good Jewish boy from Long Island. He looked at me and he said, She doesn't own me. Moses freed us. Which <laughs> for me was the most <laughs> hilarious thing. And he went and found another job down in Florida two weeks later. He was just Fair like, enough. I can't yeah. Do this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was the kind of environment you worked in. It was just, and pe some people took pride in that, and some people really got into it. I just really didn't, I couldn't get it. Like our clients were like fill up like tobacco companies and pharmaceutical companies. And, you know, that work kind of work needs to be done. It just, it doesn't need to be done by me. And I just yeah. did not enjoy it at all. So it really went against your, as you were saying, your activist sort of background and even like the sort of probably values that your dad probably taught you um, and your parents, right. because, you know, your dad was, you know, a cop. He was in the army. He was um, also a, an attorney. And I imagine the lessons which he sort of taught you um, really didn't drive with that with you. And you mentioned that you were an activist sort of throughout your 20s, um, which sounded like I was just like, oh, I want to ask him about that. So <laughs> I guess like like what, what 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 was that like for you in your 20s sort of being an activist, um, being on protests? Like what were some of the memories of being you know, out on a protest or even getting ready for, you know, going to a protest or just activism stuff, I guess. So I'm, you know, I'm originally from Detroit and Detroit has always been sort of a hotbed of activism for um, unions, for uh, civil rights. I mean, that's kind of Detroit. That's what we do. Uh, <laughs> and so I went to the University of Michigan. Uh, the Ann Arbor campus has, I don't know, like 40,000 students or so, but there were less than 300 black students, right? Uh, even though it is a, it's a public, well, I don't want to use public when, and for English people, but um, it was a, it was a state university, right? Mm. And it's uh, the fact that there were so few African-Americans there or people of color in general was always an issue. Uh, but you have to remember this is in the, you know, you know, mid to late, mid to late eighties and the political environment in the United States was just yes. about as messed up as it is now. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's cyclical. So we were protesting issues like the fact, of course, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela's, uh, you know, imprisonment at the time he was, mm -hmm. he was freed actually my last year at, at university. Um, the fact that there were there were no tenured like 
black professors at the university, the lack of, you know, sort of women, lack of diversity in general. Yeah. Um, we had people protesting, you know, sort of larger issues that were happening uh, nationwide. At one point, we actually had a strike and shut down the campus, uh, which was actually pretty cool. Matt, uh, yeah, that does sound cool. I mean, I'd like, like, yeah, that does sound pretty cool, to be fair. I would love to be able to. It was, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you felt like, and I, it's, you're very, at that point in your life, right, you're very young. You don't know much, but you are very emotionally invested in a lot of issues. Mm. Uh, everything from apartheid in South Africa to the treatment of Palestinians to closer to home, you know, cuts in funding for everything from education to mental health services. And to be able to get out there with people who are similarly, you know, inclined. And the University of Michigan has always had a reputation for being uh, a liberal campus with a, with a very activist student body. And I, and I remember we had a, um, uh, it was at the time where they had just made Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Uh, they were making it a holiday. And there was a lot of arguments over that. There were a couple of states that didn't want to do it, but it was finally, it was, it was finally close to getting done. And the University of Michigan uh, didn't want to shut the campus down. We were like, look, you should cancel classes that day rather than for say, you know, Christopher Columbus Day or whatever. And there was... <laughs> And so we had a huge strike and, you know, all the liberal and progressive students got in front and were like holding hands and telling students who didn't agree, you know, OK, you don't have to agree. Just use the back door to get into to campus. What's crazy about that is there was all this stuff about it. And, you know, they brought in like Jesse Jackson to mediate and it was a really big deal. And uh, about a year ago, a friend invited me back to campus, which is about a 45 minute drive from where I live. And I go and they have this huge MLK day event at Michigan. Now it's like classes are closed and they have like parties and they have like educational, le there's a whole lecture series and it's like a really big thing they have. And I'm sitting there going, okay, it's kind of cool that they do this now. And you know, my class, I was part of a group of people that actually made this change. And so that was actually, that's kind of the, the wonderful thing about what I do, generally speaking, and that is you get to look back and see, you know, oh, you know, actually something I did yeah, actually has had an impact because otherwise, you know, it's just pushing paper around. Yeah, right? I've, I feel like just generally sort of as humans, we love to like we all love to have an impact and like make change. So like I guess being able to see that you're probably like, Yo, I had to be standing outside, <laughs> holding hands, <laughs> right. protesting. And then now uh, y'all doing all this, like, you, <laughs> I got parties and everything and lectures, but it must have been quite a nice moment to be like, yeah, we helped this happen. Like, right. and it's kind of awesome now that the students that I hear, did like, they don't have to fight for this. They don't, this is just happening for them. Um, so yeah, I imagine that was quite a cool moment to sort of look back on. Yeah, it was. It, it was. And unfortunately, life doesn't provide, I think, most people enough of them, those moments where you go, I did something, I worked hard for it, and this is actually the outcome. All too often, particularly when it comes to, you know, political or social issues, mm. you put in lots of work and you just never see the fruits of that labor. So it's good yeah. when it does happen. Definitely. So why did you decide to be like, okay, I'm going to stop being an activist. I'm going to get a proper job. And I'm, <laughs> um, I'm going to be, I'm going to go into law instead. Like what sort of, what was that pivot? Um, getting married and having children. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Sorry. man. Like, I'll be, I'll be honest. Right. So my wife, so I, I, I met my wife here in Detroit. She was in Detroit on business. I met her. She was a wonderful. She's not my ex-wife, but we're still friends. She's a good, mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful mother. Uh, so she's Jamaican, you know, and uh, like moved from Jamaica when she was 17, Jamaican. Oh, so not okay. Like, so not even like. like you no, know, nah, she, she's for real Jamaican. She, <laughs> right. So and um, it was kind of her. She was like, you know, you've talked about law school. You need to go. So she kind of pushed me to go to law school, which I much appreciate. But then when I came out and remember, this is I graduated away from law school in 2000. So this is like 20 something years ago. And she was, I remember, uh, so in 2000, graduating from the law school I did, 
the starting salaries were like 135,000 a year, right? But the job I wanted that I ended up not, you know, the public defender mm -hmm. was paying like 45,000. And she was upset that I was even trying to get that job. She was <laughs> like, okay, wait a minute. We have been through all, the, we have been broke as hell for the last, you know, three years. You want to take job, make what? I was like, okay, I get you. All right. So I ended up at a, um, at a big firm and I was miserable. And eventually she realized that that wasn't the place for me. But that's basically why I went to law school. I had a wife, I had three kids uh, working in the nonprofit sector. Wasn't you know, <laughs> no, nah, man, that wasn't, you know, it was one of those where uh, it's good to have to it's good to have family that's mm -hmm. tight that you can rely on. And I've always been very blessed in that respect. But you don't want to be in a position where you got to like move in with your mother in law while you're going to school. And you know, no, no, that is not how you nah, want to be. It wasn't worth it. Yeah. No, nah, so, well, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, fair yeah. enough. I mean, yeah, that's that's just honest, isn't it? Like, I mean, I feel right. like that's probably quite a lot of people's experiences. Like, yo, got a family to feed. You know what I mean? I can't sort of do, do this anymore. Um, so, I guess, how did you? marriage your activism with your law because you obviously left um right. the, the firm so like how did that end up happening for you well so part of it was um i started my own firm so it was just me and one other attorney and we started working with nonprofits right so helping nonprofits with all the, sort of their legal needs and that was really and I found that to be more gratifying. And I was basically doing it on the side while I was working at the firm. I didn't have a lot of time, but I found out that while I got money from one bit, the gratification and the actual enjoyment uh, was coming from the other bit. So then mm -hmm. I had an opportunity. I saw a job in Detroit. And by this point, my wife and I were divorced, but uh, I saw a job in Detroit teaching and uh, teaching at a law school, being a law professor. And it was uh, running, basically t running a clinical program and teaching students how to practice law and work with small businesses, which I knew in spades. So I, I, I did that. So it gave me an opportunity to come back home, uh, work at a uh, it's Wayne State University, which is centered right in the middle of Detroit. Mm. Uh, and I got to work there, work with students who, um, it's funny because Detroit is the most, so this is the thing you have to know about Detroit. Detroit is an overwhelmingly black city. When I was growing up, it was like 94% black and now it's really? less. Wow. That's oh yeah. Crazy. Like When I grew up, there were no white people. I didn't really <laughs> know any white people growing up. That seems uh, like a mad word. <laughs> it, was, it was, I mean, this is just normal to me, right? Yeah, like the mayor yeah, was yeah. black, the chief of police was black. You know, the lawyers were black, the criminals were black, the judges were black, everybody was black. So um, now it's only like 84% or something like that. Uh, but it's still, you know, a very large, yeah. probably the largest, the blackest large city in America. So uh, I moved back here and I was helping, I was teaching law school, law school students how to be lawyers, how to practice and help small businesses and nonprofits. And we worked with real clients. So we were actually working with real small businesses and real nonprofits. So we got to, so it was important for me to, to help them see the real impact of the work. And probably more important than that, and this is something people overlook, is helping them with the cultural part of being a lawyer, right? So about two thirds of my students were white. And because Detroit is so segregated like Detroit is really black but our suburbs are really really white the second yeah. you like you can cross like you can see the dividing line um like because Detroit's a poor city and Detroit suburbs are some of the wealthiest in the country so a lot of our students grew up never having interacted with any black people didn't know any black people didn't have any black friends and so they would I, we would have the clients come in like I said these are real clients and I'm sitting in there as they interview and they have com cultural and racial awareness is really important when you're a lawyer because you have to understand the people who are your clients. And so many of my students didn't. So it was good to work with them to help 
them to get to understand. So, for example, they would say things like, why don't our black clients have, you know, why can't they raise money the same way our white clients can? And I and I had to explain to them. If you have, say, a f- house in Detroit, it's worth this much. If you take the exact same house and move it out to the suburbs, it's worth this much. Yeah. For most startups, for most businesses, the biggest source of revenue they have is taking equity out of their home and using that to start their business. If your home is worth less, just because it's on one side of a line, you are automatically disadvantaged when it comes to starting a business. Plus, if you live in an area, if you grew up in a community where you don't have lawyers or accountants or business people around it, you don't have the advantage of being able just to go up to your uncle and say, hey, what about this? Hey, what about that? And they go, oh, hey, this is what you have to look out for, right? So where you grow up, the the community you grow up in influences your prospects for having a successful business beyond simply, you know, whether or not there's customers there or whatever. It's just simply, it's harder to do when you have fewer of those non-formal resources. And so, and then I explained to them things like redlining. Um, what is redlining? I feel like I've, so, I feel like I've heard of it before, but it's not coming to my mind. Okay, so in the aftermath of you know, sort of World War II, the <laughs> the U.S. government set up a lot of programs to help returning veterans, and is basically a lot of the programs that help create American suburbs. Mm-hmm. Many of these programs explicitly excluded black people. Right. And they said the whites only. Right. So and one of the ways they did that was that they would, for example, if they were lending money to a housing developer. They wouldn't lend the money or, or grant insurance for, for the project if it was near black people. So on the maps, they would literally use a red marker to divide to show along wow. eight mile in Detroit. There is a physical wall that separates where the black neighborhood was and where the white neighborhood was. And that wall was built because the development, the housing project, couldn't get federal support unless there was a physical dividing line between the white com- the white neighborhood and the black neighborhood. That's crazy, man. Yeah. That's this, crazy. And, and I, this is the law, right? I mean, yeah. And it's still, and so what would happen is when they started. You know, so what happens is you, when you start of how much are these homes worth? Well, the homes on the wrong side of that, that are on the yeah. other side are worth less. Not only worth less, they pay higher insurance. I mean, it's just, and the legacy of that is still around and everywhere. I mean, there's a reason, I don't know if you have the phrase there, um, wrong side of the tracks. Or so, I, it, like, I feel like, yeah. That's it. Uh, ish, ish, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if someone says that to you, you already know what it means. Like, yeah, you were just right. born on the poorer side than the richer side. Is the wall still there? Is it still, do they still have parts of that wall Eric? Yeah, you can still, I mean, it doesn't serve the same purpose, but yeah, the wall is still there. You people go and look at it. It's, you know. That's kind of crazy. And this isn't a lifetime ago. This <laughs> is in my, I mean, this stuff happened within my father's lifetime. Mm. Um. So... It's not like we're talking about things that happened millions of years ago. These are yeah, things that yeah. happened, you know, relatively recently. Yeah, that's crazy. And I can just imagine the legacy of that probably still like, like, as I said, the wall's still there. Like, sure, it doesn't maybe mean the same because I'm sure maybe now you have a few more black people in those suburbs. But like, you can still see that physical representation of what happened. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think it's so interesting that in terms of with your role as a lecturer that you had to like, you had to sort of teach um, your white students, okay, like this is sort of, this is why there's a disadvantage. This is why black people can't get as much equity. And it's kind of sad because you're like, listen, I know you're not intentionally trying to be horrible. Like, I know you're not intentionally (laughs) like, oh, why can't they do this? Like, because really you just don't know, like you don't know what you don't know, isn't it? You don't know what you haven't experienced um, or what someone hasn't taught you. So I imagine for a lot of them, that was quite a shocker. Like, oh, 
damn, now they have to start questioning everything they everything they've been grown up with, everything they've experienced. Um, did you have any? I don't know. I guess not, maybe not pushback, but like, were some students more receptive than other students? Like, how was it sort of like? Because you're really you're really sort of breaking down narratives which they've lived with for their whole lives. Now they're coming yeah. to a uni where someone's being like, one well, mate, life isn't equal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, you're right. And I think there was some pushback, but it wasn't, it wasn't as severe as you might expect. Uh, and I think that's in large part because of the type of students that we tend to get at Wayne Law. I mean, it's located in the middle of Detroit. Uh, this, I think this generation, the younger, the generation of students I was teaching were probably a lot more open-minded and mm. they they were in uni so they wanted to learn right i mean they weren't just interested in making money they were taking my class in part because everybody knew what my class was about and how i handled it so they they were actually interested in it and one of the things i would do is take the students on a tour of detroit and a lot of them they lived in the suburbs but they would come to detroit they would only come go downtown or you know sort of the the hip parts of the city. Yeah, they never really, the they didn't see. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So I would take them on it. And so white people call what happened in Detroit in 1967, they largely call it the riots. Here in Detroit, we call it the rebellion or the uprising. Uh, that's what black people call it. Uh, it was the worst riots in US history until the LA riots and only in terms of people killed. Mm. But one more person died in LA than died in Detroit. Oh, that made it so much more worse. So, one. <laughs> it's a big difference. We, took, <laughs> we actually took out more police officers and soldiers than they did. When the riot happened here, they actually had to call in the 101st Airborne to put it down. I mean, there were tanks wow. rolling down the street. It was... That's something. Yeah, and it, and it happened because there had just been so much police abuse, such a difference in the opportunities afforded black Americans versus white Americans, you know, it just all sort of bubbled up. And one night on what's now called Rosa Parks Boulevard, 12th Street, uh, Vietnam vet was returning home, uh, was having a, a party and it just, and the police came in to break it up, things erupted and it just took over the whole city. There are parts of Detroit you can drive through that have not been rebuilt since then. Wow. And this is June 1967, right? So you can drive through Detroit and Detroit's actually a fairly large city. We have about 700,000 people now. But when I was in high school in 19, you know, 1980s, 1980 census had it at like 1.8 million, hmm. 1.6 million. So we've lost over a million people from Detroit. But the city itself hasn't gotten any smaller. Yeah. Uh, it may have fewer people, but you can drive for blocks and blocks and blocks, just like, and there'd just be nothing there. A lot of it just sort of, you know, decayed during a, a recession we had, um, but a lot of it was just never fixed after 67. And of course, that's not the part that the kids coming in from the suburbs see. Mm -hmm. Or if they do, they go and they see it like, ooh, this is creepy, this is kind of cool. But when they learn the history behind it, it sort of changed their minds and made them a lot more willing to understand what the people were going through in a city that was, you know, had been so deprived of tax revenue that at one point, more than 70 percent of the streetlights in Detroit didn't work. You could drive. I mean, it was total darkness. That's mad. Hey. So things are a lot better now. They are. Yeah. I mean, but there was a period where. The streetlights didn't work. The city couldn't afford to clean up the garbage. Parks couldn't afford. And a large part of that wasn't was because we'd lost so many people that the tax base deteriorated. Dropped, yeah. And the other part was a deliberate effort by the city, the state of Michigan, where Detroit is located, is mostly white. And so what they would do is uh, they really mess with the city, cut off taxes and funding and this is devolving into a history lesson, but uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But yeah, I mean, but a lot of it was just like letting, you know, these kids who, to a large degree, been privileged their whole life, see what growing up in Detroit really meant. Mm. And it made, I think it actually made them better lawyers. Yeah. No, don't worry. I love a history lesson. I, I, I was just listening because <laughs> like, I didn't really know anything about the Detroit riots. Um, 
and for something that, as you said, has had such a huge impact on Detroit. I think it's like one for me. I was I was just I was just learn, loving to listen to it and learning about it. But <laughs> for your students, like who actually live in Detroit and are going to be lawyers working with the people of Detroit, like the suburbs everywhere, like and the in the city. I think it is really important that they are able to get those lessons um, and to learn from that. So, yeah, no, that's 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 cool. Like, I'm glad. Um, I usually, usually find that as you go younger and each generation sort of become more accepting, but I think it's still amazing that those students out there are willing to learn and willing to change their perspective because that can be quite a hard thing to learn about and quite a hard thing to understand. And just them being receptive is a really good thing. Well, you know, it's... Uh, if. If there's nothing else on display in the United States at the moment, I would say this. There is a shortage of people who are willing to try to understand uh, for reasons I do not myself understand. But, uh, you know, it's it's the younger people who I have more faith in, people my age and older. You know, we need to get out of the way because <laughs> we are too set in our ways, I think, to actually... Uh, do make the kind of compromise and display the kind of empathy and understanding that we need. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you've got people like you, so I'm sure there's more like you, but maybe not enough like you. Um, but I wanted to sort of know, I guess, you know, as someone that was an activist, as someone that um, is a lawyer, um, I, w- I say was an activist, but I imagine just in everything you still do, you sort of still do activism. Um, but oh, I get, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still do protests. I still go to, I'm still, you know, screaming at people at city council meetings and, <laughs> and things like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's what you are. You can never change that. Yeah. So I guess while you were working in law, were there any sort of like criminal injustices that you just were like, oh, they made your blood boil. Like if, if, if I was to give you just like 30 minutes to rant, which I'm not just giving you 30 minutes to rant, but <laughs> if I was giving you like 30 minutes to rant about an injustice you saw while working in law, what would it be? So, I mean, you know, so I'm still a lawyer. I just, you know, I, I work for a nonprofit and we deal with, I mean, so this is easy. So I work for a nonprofit right now called the Detroit Justice Center. It's basically a nonprofit law firm. And I work on economic equity practices, which means I'm helping communities sort of address their eco- the economics and development in the economic development area. But another part of our job deals with, uh, another part of our firm deals with primarily returning citizens, which is the, how we refer to people coming back to their community from having been imprisoned, right? And the number of things you will see that drive you crazy, here's one. <laughs> I had to breathe before. If you if if you're not watching this on YouTube, <laughs> yeah. So so in our office, there was a guy who was a returning citizen, right? And he didn't work for us, but he worked for the building. And he had been locked up for something he didn't do, which is not uncommon. Most people. Most people in Michigan, most people across the country who are in jail as opposed to prison, right, haven't been convicted of anything. They just don't have the money to get out, to pay bond, right? So, oh, so it's even more than that. So in order to get out, so this is the thing. They they did a study, and most Americans don't have $500 to handle an emergency, okay? If this is that's just how most people's finances are. Most people live in check to check. So if you get arrested for something, whether you did it or not, in order to get out until your trial, they issue bond. And the purpose of bond is to make sure that you show up to court. If bond is so high that you can't get out, that's a problem um, because. I mean, for some people, it might take a $500 bond to make sure they show up for other because you lose the money if you don't show up. Okay. For other people, it might take millions. And if you, what you did was so hein- so heinous and so, uh, and it seems pretty clear at this point that you're a danger to society, you shouldn't be granted bond no matter how much money you make, right? But this is the point. If you get picked up, let's say you get arrested, right? And you don't have $500 to make bond. 
This is what happens because of this. Let's say you were on your way to pick up your kids. You park somewhere and you get picked up. One, your car is going to get towed because it's been sitting in a place you'd only planned on parking there for a little bit. You didn't pay put three days in your parking. Meter, right? <laughs> I'm going to be gone. Who knows? <laughs> right, exactly. Two, you were on your way to pick up your kids. If you don't pick up your kids, you could lose custody of your children because child and social services, who's going to take care of them if you don't have a spouse or somebody else? So you may lose your job or your bill, you know, your utilities might be cut off. This is why you're sitting in jail because you don't have mo- like 300 bucks to get out. It may be months or weeks before you get to see a, before you actually get to see a, get in front of a judge for real. In the meantime, your entire life has fallen apart. At that point, you may plead guilty to something you didn't did, do just because you think, well, I'm better off serving 30 days or just t- or getting probation, even if I'm innocent, because I can't stay in jail, and have my life go to hell. Right. And then on top of that, ooh, right. If you do manage to post bond and then you can't and you show up or you don't or you end up having to pay up, pay them off. Right. And you don't have money. They can come and arrest you again. So basically, these are all penalties for being poor. Now, that's just the that's just sort of in general. What happened to this dude who worked in our office is even worse. He had an ankle monitor on. Right. That's one of the things they do, which most people don't know. You have to pay for that ankle monitor. Right. Oh, really? They charge you for that? <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but that, that's no, ridiculous. That's and if ridiculous. you don't pay, they can lock you up, right? So you have <laughs> to pay for the ankle monitor. They can, So he he was on probation. He had to be, you know, so he would have to tell them where he was, right? So he was supposed to be in certain places at certain times. They came and arrested him and kept him locked up for three days because his ankle monitor said he was at one place. And he was supposed to be working at another address. Okay. His ankle monitor, our building was on a corner. His ankle monitor was giving the address that's on one street, but the address for the building we work is on this street. So he got arrested, even though he didn't do anything wrong. He got locked up for three days, for three days, because his ankle monitor showed like he was violating... (laughs) His uh, probation because it showed him being in some place that he wasn't. Surely you use common sense and you just be like, "Yo, like, <laughs> come on!" It's probably it's probably just is the literal the street just around the corner. Like, is there no grace? Is there no nothing mm-hmm. to be like? Oh, maybe, may, maybe we screwed up a little, or maybe our technology isn't the best. Like, I, I imagine it would have literally said, "Oh, he's literally on the next street." You could have looked at the maps and been like, oh, well, he was yeah. like in the same building, but. Right. That would require you to consider people who are returning citizens as human beings. Mm. And we don't do that. That's why pe- people who get locked up, like your chances, if you're a black American in the United States, you have a one in three chance of being arrested and sent to jail at some point. Right. In New York, they had, when I was living in New York, they had Rudy Giuliani was mayor Uh, and Michael Bloomberg, and they had stop and frisk. Now, I don't know if people understand what stop and frisk means, because, and they were doing it primarily to Black and Latinos. At one point, they had searched, stopped and frisked more Black and Latinos than actually lived in the city. So they were basically stopping people more than once when you counted up the numbers. It's like they it was like they stopped it for every single black and Latino <laughs> man a couple of times because that's how high the numbers were. And the way stop and fist work is this because it used to happen to me all the time because I went to school in Manhattan at Columbia and I lived in Brooklyn, East Flatbush. And I would get off at Church Avenue on the train and I had like a three block walk to my house. And stop and frisk was not, excuse me, sir, would you come here? Stop and frisk was somebody not even in a uniform half the time with their badge, like tucked inside their shirt, walking up to you late at night, pushing you to get in the wall, pulling a gun out and saying, let me see some ID. It takes you a second to realize you are not being robbed, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. And it is the most humiliating, frustrating experience in the world, getting called all sorts of names, accused of things, just 
And they did that to basically the entire Black and Latino male community in the city of New York for years, right? So those kind of just sort of blatant injustices, people think that if you don't get shot by the police or if you're not like arrested, it's, you know, oh, it's, it wasn't that bad. But being a grown ass man forced to my knees with my hands behind my back and a gun to my head by the government, and I've done nothing wrong, is those kind of daily humiliations and frustrations add up in a way that if you, unless you've experienced it, it is really hard to understand, you know, the level, let me not, <clears throat> the level of anger it can generate. And like I said, my family's cops, right? Mm. I, all the friends of my, you know, I grew up with their parents were cops too. So it's not as though I have some inherent bias against police officers. But that kind of policing can lead to the kind of anger and frustration that you see, you know, when riots happen. Yeah. Right? It's, That's, it's brutal. Yeah. To be fair, I, I think when you have, because we have stop and searches here in England, and I, I, there definitely have been experiences. Like, I, I thankfully, I've never been sort of stopped and searched. I, I live in a smaller town. Um, but like in London, like my cousin has literally, the police have been like, can we look in your, in your van? Why are you here? Why are you here? And he's like, I'm literally visiting my friend. He's like, for some reason he was able just to tell him to go and piss off. And then he walked into the house. Cause he, he was like, they don't, they don't have any control. They don't have control over me, but there have been instances where police have been sort of physical with people. But I think when you've got the element of like guns, it just adds sort of a whole different level. Like, as you are yeah. saying, like you on the street and somebody like in plain clothing, like, yeah, you, you figured am I being robbed? Like, it's no, this is a police officer that is instilling this fear into me. For what reason? Like for generally, for what reason? Like, how can you do that to somebody else? Surely knowing what, it, how that person is going to feel when you press them up against a wall and put a gun to their head and you're a police and you, and you have a duty to protect. It just, it, it honestly makes me bong. It makes me think that's just crazy, but I mean, that's the experiences of people. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. It's just kind of the nature of uh, living in America. And now, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I'm not saying I hate America, but there are some things wrong with it. And the prevalence of guns is certainly one of them. It was, <laughs> you know, that's just kind of weird. Yeah, it adds a different element. I guess um, on this sort of this topic of sort of, um, discrimination within the states and um and within the prison system within police um for you have did you in, experience any discrimination like within your law profession like throughout oh, yeah. the years oh yeah all the time so like less than 10 percent of the lawyers in america are black and so my name is eric williams which is probably the whitest sounding name you could possibly <laughs> come up with just and if you look at my CV, yeah, if you, and my, my mother did that intentionally. My parents did that intentionally. My sister has the an equally white name. Her name was Jennifer, right? So Eric and Jennifer. So if you just look at my CV, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think that I was black. And there were plenty of times where um, I would walk into an interview, an in-person interview, and all they'd done is they'd heard me over the phone and then they'd read my CV. And when I walk in, they're like, uh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> right. Which I always thought was real funny. Um, but so when I came out of law school, I went to a pre pretty prestigious law school and you do interviews and, you know, on campus interviews. When you, and so I had locks at the time. Right. So, you know, I, my, my hair wasn't great uh, <laughs> and it was much longer and it, I had I had locks. So. Uh, I went to interviews and I didn't even get any offers. And I was like, why? And my father looked at me and said, you really don't know why. You don't need to like, come on. He's like, look come in on, the man. mirror, bro. Look. <laughs> so I cut off my locks. I cut off my dreadlocks. I offer, offer, offer. All of a sudden, things went so much smoother. So I was like, okay. That's crazy. Just just that small thing of cutting off your locks. In and I it makes you think it's like, okay, I don't want to like get like conspiracy theory in this. Like, I don't want to be like, <laughs> oh, it's because of the locks. But when you go from one extreme to the next and then some of these things change, 
it's sort of like eh, maybe it was maybe it was the lux probably was the lux but it was make, and, yeah <laughs> i had a uh, one in one interview the guy literally told me he said you know our firm is really committed to you know diversity and the contributions of everyone regardless of the race creed or color i said you know, I done my research. I said, that's interesting you say that because you actually don't have any lawyers in your New York office, any black lawyers. And he said, oh, well, it's not that we wouldn't hire you because you're black. That wouldn't stop us from hiring you. Now, as far as making partner, that's a different story because, you know, that means getting along uh, with those boys club and that's not you. And I was really offended. Like, wait, you're just saying my career prospects are you telling me ahead of time. And so I reported them to school. They actually banned their firm from recruiting on campus for a number of years. In retrospect, I wish I hadn't done that because the guy who told, who did this was a middle-aged Jewish guy. And he was trying to help me. Mm. He was trying, I mean, he was, he, he felt some, you know, some connection. And I, looking back on it, I realized this a few years later, he was trying to tell me, look, go here work a few years, then go somewhere else because there's a ceiling here because yeah. you're black. And I didn't realize that that's what he was saying. But after I started practicing, so one of the things you'll notice in America is there are a lot of, there are a lot of Jewish Americans who work in finance, right? The reason that is, or is basically the same reason you see a lot of Jewish people in, in like the jewelry business, is because at the time, people were like, that's not the stuff we want to do. Yeah. So those kind of law firms weren't the high, you know, the finance law firms. Jews were basically excluded from doing the other work that was considered the prestigious work. And so they all found themselves sort of shuttled off into finance. And then finance blew up. And suddenly they're like, oh, OK, we're just going yeah. we're gonna to stay over here. <laughs> we might as well, you know. <laughs> might as well. So he was looking at me like, yo, you know, compadre, let me let, let me drop some knowledge on you. Mm. Um, it was still kind of, I mean, what he, he wasn't being racist, but he was letting me in on the fact that the, the system writ right. large was. Yeah. 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 He was, but, he was li mean, literally telling you the truth. He was literally like, yo, yeah. you're not going to get far here. Like how it comes across, you obviously, you, you get a bit offended. You'd be like, well, that was a bit rude, but I guess, yeah, with perspective, <laughs> yeah. you're like, oh, yeah, you exactly. know, he was telling me that it's a boys club and that they're not going to let me into this boys club. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't smile over there. It's not like England's any better. <laughs> no, I'm not I live there. I know. <laughs> uh, no, England, I, I like to call it ocean breeze racism. You, it <laughs> happens to you. You feel it, but you can't pinpoint. You can't pinpoint it. Um, sometimes I'd rather, I don't know, actually. I, I mean, I'd rather there not be any racism at all. But like, there's times where yeah. I'm like, yo, I'd m much rather somebody just say it to my face and be sneaky about it because at least it's like the devil you know isn't it rather than the devil right. you don't know I was like I'd rather know where it's coming from so I can not punch in the face I don't know but at least I can at least I can swing at it I can't swing at yeah. the wind you know it's exactly. just not gonna happen <laughs> exactly oh so I went to so I, I went to Cambridge and I was at Maldon College which is the most was the most traditional college. Like when I, my there, year there was like the first year they admitted women. They were the last college at Cambridge to do so. Wow, what a flex! Um, for the last college to admit women, guys. Look cool. <laughs> oh, yo, we had we had a we had a dining hall, and you had to wear your. Whenever you're in college, you're really supposed to wear your little robe. It was like Harry Potter and stuff. Yeah. Uh, we had no electric lights. We ate by candlelight. They had like high table. There was like to the queen, you know, like. Toasting every, and as me, an American who never really traveled abroad before, this was, and before Harry Potter, so I had no idea what it, what to well, be. Was gonna be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was gonna be like, it was crazy. And then one day, I was invited to dinner at um, with one of my one of the professors, right? He was me and a couple of other students, and. I go and there's another, and one of the students there tells a joke. I don't remember the entire joke, but I do remember the punchline. Let a Kaffir do it. Let a Kaffir do it. What? 
What is a kafa? I've never yeah. even heard of that term. It doesn't sound good. It's a but South it's... African. It's a South African term that basically is nigger. Wow. And yeah. I knew it because I had I had some South African friends. Mm. So I knew what the term meant. And I was like, Yo. did my man just tell a nigger joke? <laughs> you probably were just thinking that in your head like, oh my gosh, did um, 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 what? Am I in the right place? It was so blatant. I mean, literally, it was so blatant. I was taken aback. I was like, should I hit him? <laughs> or, should, I, should I hit him? And I looked around the table, and I'm the only black person in the room. There's like seven of us. And the professor, he, he was just like, hmm, more tea. Uh, <laughs> I got, yo, I got a lot. British thing yeah. ever, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna sweep this under the rug. Does anybody want to? Yes. <laughs> I love, yo. At some point, you kind of have to love the way the British will handle things. It's like, yeah, we're just gonna pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. It's uh, honestly, yeah. I could I could get into a rant or a riot by myself just talking about the British system in itself. I was talking to my sister the other day about politics, and she was like, "Yo, don't get mad at me. I'm not I'm not in charge." And I'm like, "I'm sorry. I just get so passionate about it, like, and I just get so yeah, angry." You at have times. no choice. <laughs> yeah, so that's because you care, right? You yeah. and, and when you care, you get emotionally engaged in a way that you know you don't when it. I mean. You're just like, okay, that's a bad thing, but I got other things to worry about. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess for you, sort of, we talked you talked about some of your experiences within law. Um, how how did you sort of um overcome or even just sort of persevere through them? Um, because yeah, as you said, you're like when people see your name, people see that you went to Columbia, that you went to Cambridge, they're probably like, damn. This guy's good. This guy, <laughs> this guy's white. <laughs> yeah, so like, basically. How did you sort of overcome all those sort of um, I guess discriminations, which is discriminations, but like, yeah, those events. Mm, so part of it was um I had the help of I have, I have a real strong family, right? And so the kind of people when I was when I was young, my father used to tell me. And this is a baseball analogy, so I don't know how well this is going to resonate with uh, people who, you know, like cricket. But uh, mm -hmm. so he was like, you were born with two strikes against you. You were poor and you were born black. You got an inside fastball on the way and absolutely nobody but family cares whether you strike out or not. You, and so... Just sort of saying, and always reminded me, you have to be twice as good to get half as far. And so sometimes it's incredibly frustrating, but you tell yourself when you're up against someone who doesn't have those disadvantages, I always used to tell myself, why am I worried about them? I'm used to working without a safety net. I'm used to walking this tightrope and knowing if I fall, it's over. Right. What I've been through, why am I going to worry about them? Yeah. I have, as much as I have been through, your little soft behind is going to take me out. Nah, nah. Uh, I work too hard. Yeah. Right. So that's part of it. But that requires ha having a very supportive, you know, a large and intense support network, which I, I'm really blessed to have. Right. The other part of it is, this is going to sound bad, I guess. <laughs> I moved back to. I moved back to Detroit, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> where where the fact that I'm black isn't as much of a factor in some ways, mm. uh, at least not on a day to day grind. Um, you know, it's just I'm I'm living life and fighting for the things I believe in. Um, and then I spend, and I really believe in a lot of work I do, and one of the things. I would love to see, I will know that we have made advances to um, to sort of a, a more just society when we don't have to talk about like black excellence. 
we can, you know, sort of just accept black mediocrity. Uh, I mean, <laughs> when you hear people talking about all these, oh, I did this and I worked so hard and I did this and I overcame, bro, we shouldn't have to, mm. right? I want to get to the point where, you know, the fact that you, the, you could just be like some regular old dude with no particular aspirations who stumbles into something and turns out to be, you know, either uh, some kind of success or just like a happy person moving along their life. You know, you shouldn't have to be excellent at everything or even anything to be able to just live a normal life. And I want us, I want us as a society to get to the point where uh, black mediocrity uh, can thrive. Yeah. Right. You know, it's uh, you shouldn't have to be exceptional at something or anything uh, just to live your life. Yeah, it's right? it's sort of like the justific. It's like we're sort of justifying our existence by what we achieve. When it's like we shouldn't have to justify our existence in the first place. It should exactly. just be that we're here. We're all here, like at the end of the day, you know what I mean. And I liked that analogy. Listen, I don't know baseball. I haven't played baseball before. Um, have something called rounders which is just a little different um oh yeah yeah <laughs> but i i liked the analogy because yeah you, you're on two strikes a fastball's coming your way um and you're i think your dad sort of put it really nicely that and the fact that you sort of still remember that till this day um sort of the power of analogies but then also the fact that it was it was very accurate it's like yeah your family are the only people that are going to care what happens to you after your third strike. Like they're the ones that are going to be there for you. Um, and I like how you talked about having a support system around you and having a family around you. Um, I wanted to just ask something um, which you sort of mentioned throughout the episode, and I am going to throw a fastball at you. Um, <laughs> um, you mentioned that you sort of divorced from your wife Um and so I guess for you, like you talked about how that was, how you've got a good family structure and that you had a lot of support. And you even talked about how she pushed you to go and become a, a lawyer. So I guess for you, what was your sort of feelings when you went through that divorce? And not necessarily that you lost your support system, but that it sort of got impacted. Mm. Again, I got to say I'm blessed because I didn't lose anything. Yeah, uh, I'm still good friends with my in-laws. I mean, I say this about West Indians, yo. Once you're in the family, unless you do something really foul, you can't get away. You can't. <laughs> my my mother-in-law, my ex-mother-in-law, still calls me. Eric, how you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm good, Katilda. I'm, I, you know, it's so. I, I, I was blessing that my daughter is actually in the next. My uh, oldest daughter is in the next room right now. Um, I was. Because of the way things happen, um, it was disappointing, like Christmas lost, if I didn't have the kids, you know, the whole idea of Christmas just sort of lost its luster in some ways, you know, major holidays, you don't want to celebrate the same way. Um, but uh, and for a while, I felt kind of like, I mean, real talk, you feel like you were a failure, right? It, you You spend your whole life thinking you want you know, you kind of want a family and to build that. And then it's like, yo, I blew it. It didn't happen. Right. It's not the way, you know, you really kind of question like, what the hell am I doing? You know, what went wrong? Um, but I was really blessed and I, you know, I still, my wife and I, ex-wife and I raised our kids. Um, my, one of my daughters lived with me, the other, uh, you know, as a matter of convenience, because, you know, she got to save up money to be a, even though she's 26, so she's a, a, a grown woman, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. So, you know, I'm, my youngest daughter's doing well, my son's doing well. So I think feeling like there was a point where I could have lost it all, right? And that's kind of scary. Um, it makes me really appreciate the place I am with my kids. Uh, you know, I guess my ex-wife sends me sort of daily affirmations and not daily, but, you know, twice a week I'll get affirmations about yeah. uh, stuff. She's a really good person. You know, she's remarried and happy. Um, man, is pulling together family is sometimes the hardest part about it because you're trying to do all the other stuff in life, you know, make a living and it's rough. But, 
you know, like I said, I, I, I feel like I'm truly, you know, I have to be grateful for how things turned out because it could have gone, it could have gone sideways. Yeah, true. Right? Yeah. You're, yeah, because as you said, you're still part of the family. You still have a good relationship with her. You still have a, you have a great relationship with your kids by the sounds of it. So yeah, it mm-hmm. could have gone worse. And like, I think your attitude towards it in terms of like, listen, it was a, it was a, it was like a hard time for you, but you're grateful for, you're grateful, not necessarily for it, but for how it's gone because it could have gone worse. Um, and you're sort of in a good position if I got that correctly. No, you did. And there's nothing. So I think that actually, I think there are two types of people in the world. There are people that can, you know, they come close to everything falling apart and they go, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. I'll just keep walking right up to the edge again and again and eventually they fall over. And then there are people who they see that cliff and they go, oh, I am never going to let that happen again. And that's the approach I took to like the relationship with, you know, like my kids, my, you know, ex in law, everything. It was life. And I could see it. It was right there. I could see a version of my life that involved me not having what I have right now. And, you know, it was one of those things where one or two words could have tilted it one way or the other. There's something on the tip of your tongue. And you know, if you say it, you can never bring that back. You can never take it back, right? You can create the kind of harm that just can't be repaired. And I never got there, but I realized how close I was. And I see people all the time, unfortunately, who like they're estranged from their kids or whatever. And I feel for them. And actually, I kind of wonder because I got I got two daddy's girls. And so... I wonder, like, what did you have to do to push your daughters away like that, right? That's, yeah. or what did you have to do to make your son have no respect for you? You know, and if you could go back and change it, would you? Because I, look, my daughters, my sons, they just, they are my world. I love them so much. Yeah. Right? So. No, that's good to hear. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, my sister's a daddy's girl. Um, <laughs> uh, she's like, love you, daddy. Like, 16, yeah. still a daddy's girl. Um, she's also a mom's girl as well, but like, she's very she's close to both of them. But yeah, she's very much a daddy's girl. But yeah, you you wonder, like, I don't know what I don't know what my dad could do to sour my sister off him. Like, it would, it would have to be something really horrific. Um, and I think even like, as you were saying, when you, you're working with people that are quite vulnerable that maybe have been through some traumatic stuff in their life or have been to prison. Um, and like, for me, I work in social care settings and I see children that are sort of been traumatized and abused. And it always just makes you reflect on what you're grateful for in your life. Because yeah. like, I've, like, I've seen kids who can't have a good, rela- who don't have a good relationship with their mom or their mom abused them and anything that reminds them of their mom just, like affects their body, affects their headspace. And I'm just like, damn, like I'm I'm grateful that I have a good family and I have a good support network and family. I think doing the work that we do definitely makes you more grateful for what you have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Eric, I've loved this whole conversation that we've had. Um, and I sort of just wanted to ask you one final question. Um, sure. just sort of ask all my guests, um, Say if there's a young black boy listening to this conversation, how can something that you know help them with an understanding of themselves? Hmm. So I actually do spend a lot of time mentoring. And one of the things, particularly for, for us black men, it's like our role and the expectations of us not just from society, but from like within our own community are constantly in flux. And sometimes you just want to say, be fearless, right? Just just ex- ex- don't be afraid of being who you are. Don't be afraid of, and this is the hard part, don't be afraid of accepting that who you are is not just one thing, right? It's not, you know, 
accept all the parts of you, the parts that are afraid, the parts that are angry, the parts that are corny, the parts that are romantic, even the parts that are, you know, fearful, accept all that. Well, Thoreau said, you know, if I contradict myself, I contradict myself. You know, I'm immense. I contain multitudes, mm. right? Too many times we feel like we have to be, you know, we got to be hard all the time, right? We have to be, you know, there's this whole sort of on the grind. We always got to be, you know, hustling, making that money, be about that bag. We always have to do all that. We, you know, there's a certain way we have to treat, you know, the women we love in our life or, you know, that the person in our life has to be a woman. That, you know, that, I mean, there are all these expectations that may not line up with who you are or may partially line up, but accept that. It, 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 accept that who you are is who you are. And these, you know, these outside expectations shouldn't define you and that you are not required to be hard all the time. You are not required to be afraid to ask questions, to show vulnerability. Um, and for that matter, don't be afraid to man up sometimes. You know, it's just, it's a delicate balance and requires life experience. But what I would say is accept, not just accept, right? Aggressively embrace the your internal contradictions and and fears and everything else because you're a whole person, right? You get to have all of these different um, parts of you, and don't let anybody force you to be, you know, just sort of one dimensional. That's not you, and you can't be happy if you're forced into that position. You can't be successful if you're forced into that. Yeah, brilliant. No, thank you very much, Eric. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation and I really appreciate you joining me here today. Um, no, thanks. Well. I appreciate the time. No, it's cool. It's cool. I definitely will. Have, you know, everyone I talk to, I'm like, oh, now I have to go and visit that place. I mean, I, I would love to visit Detroit and Michigan. It'd be quite interesting. And now that you told me about the history, I definitely now want to see it too. So, hey, man, I'm your true guard. You make it here. Yeah. Yo. I got a I got a guest bedroom. You can stay there, uh, and, I, and I give you a personal tour around the D man. You can see what Detroit is really about. Beautiful. I'm sure you can take me to some good food spots as well. Um, there you go. So bless, bless. All right. Thank you very much for joining me, Eric. And I hope you. Have hey, a good thanks day. a lot. Hey, same to you. Love, peace, and hair grease, man. <laughs>